Uh, good morning, book fighters. It is Monday, September 13th. And I've said those words about four times. I'm not even kidding. I keep recording the video. It keeps messing up. The software I'm using clearly just isn't very good. And I, this was just going to be a great video. And I like scripted it. And I was like on a roll. And I recorded it three times. So I kind of know it off my heart now anyway. So I'm going to do it without any jump cuts. It's just me talking to you. And then I'm just going to upload it straight to YouTube. Um... And I'm recording this on my iPod Touch, my new one, so it, the video should be okay at least. Um, yeah. So let's begin. Um, and to be fair, Lauren does this every Tuesday. La uh, Lauren's really good at it though, and she can keep talking, and I'm not. I need jump cuts, but I'm going to do the very best that I can. Um, so this week I read uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, and I also read Demon in the Bottle, which is an Iron Man graphic novel. Um... Uh, but I also read Ode to Kirihito, a, a manga by Mangu God, uh, Sama Tatsuka, who I love. Um, uh, so I thought that I would not talk about The Art of War this week, and I thought instead I'd do you a little video about comic books and graphic novels, a medium that I really, really enjoy. And I feel like it's a medium, much like young adult literature, that's constantly underestimated um, in terms of its value towards storytelling. Uh, so, okay, let's talk about some terminology. Okay, so, uh, see, I would have jump cut it there. I would have jump cut it to me holding you up this, which is a single issue of a comic book. This is a Batman comic book. Uh, and this is several issues of several comic books. And when certain given issues of a certain story arc are bound together into one thing, uh, that's called a trade. An example of a trade is... <laughs> A demon in a bottle, uh, which is what I read this week. This is an example of a trade. Uh, this is a collection of stories, Iron Man 120 to 128, which was published in 1979, I think. Um, yeah, and this is a story bound together uh, called a trade. And this was... Yeah, trade. <laughs> you see... You see why I need junk cuts? Anyway, um, so the history of comic books is divided into four significant periods. We've got the golden age of comic books from like, the 30s to the early 50s, and that's when you get all your uh, all your archetypal superheroes, everything that you come to stereotype with comic books, that's where that comes from. You know, there's a lot of Superman saving a lot of beautiful damsels from a lot of burning buildings. like. That kind of thing was standard, and comics were really just fine on their feet, and they were kind of niche, and um, they didn't have a huge. Well, I mean that that's that's the period, that's the time people were people started thinking, oh, these are these are kind of cool, but the stories were very much that they were all very stereotypical, um, and that, that's the like golden age of comics, and the silver age of comics charts the kind of early fifties to the early seventies, no, earlier than that. See, now I would have cut that out. Would have cut that out. I think it's like the six. 50s to the mid 60s, maybe. Oh. Oh. God, it's so hard without jump cuts. Um, but anyway, that's that's the kind of period where comic books started to grow both commercially and artistically. People started to get really behind them. They started trying out new things with different stories, like you had romance comics and horror comics, and that was quickly suppressed by the media saying, whoa, like. Because this book's got pictures and it must be for kids. And that's that's a big problem that comic books face. Um, and I think it's much like young adult literature in that way. Like, people get upset if it covers themes that are, that are a bit controversial. Because, God forbid, kids learn about the truth. Um, so, yeah, that's a kind of silver age. But uh, when you get to the Bronze Age of comic books, um, 70s to 80s kind of time, uh, that's when you they really started to explore different issues and publishers started to understand that whilst people enjoyed superheroes and they enjoyed all that and they enjoyed the evil super villains they really couldn't connect to the characters they needed these characters to suffer from problems that real everyday people did such as alcoholism um it's a one junker give me a break uh so the modern age of comics which is the mid 80s to the, the modern day not surprisingly, uh, that's when you know really good comic books now, like uh, The Watchmen by Alan Moore. Um, these can the characters containing these can be you know just 
as full and as psychologically complex um, as as any other form of media. I mean, this this is an incredible piece of work, and it goes to show that um, they're not limited. It's not a genre that's limited in any way. Um, yeah, uh, the Japanese version of comic books is called manga. Um, I have an example for you here. This is Death Note. Um, and these are serialized in magazines, so uh, it's the, the equivalent here of, say, Marvel Comics doing a magazine uh, and having, like, Thor, Captain America, Spider-Man, all coming out in the magazine. And if they do well in the magazine, uh, this one was published in Shonen Jump, um, if they do well in that, they get these kind of book release formats, which are really cool, and then if they do well in that form, they are translated and released for a Western audience, like us. Um, and then you get people like Osamu Tetsuka, who, uh, at the moment, I mean, he's he's revered as king manga. Um, and at the moment, Vertical Publishing are reduce, releasing these huge um, one-volume epics containing, you know, I mean, these will have been serialized as well, but they're published like this, massive. Um, because people people love to read Tetsuka. Um, things like this, which contain the story from beginning to end, like there's no, there's only one volume, uh, like this and like Watchmen, um, they're also called graphic novels. And graphic novels is kind of the umbrella term that I'm going to use to talk about everything else from now on, because that's what they are. They're novels with the, the used graphics. Uh, right, yeah. Mm. So this week, <laughs> all my stuff, that I should have really put all my books here. Anyway, so this week I read Demon in a Bottle. Um, and this was published in 1979, which would make it a Bronze Age comic, which the, the subject of Tony Stark struggling with alcoholism would kind of suggest. Um, but it's kind of early Bronze Age. So it still has a lot of those Silver Age values. It's almost the equivalent of kind of testing the water to see what they can get away with. And it's kind of funny in that way. And, and the writing in it says a lot about society at the time, where, you know, they were okay with burning buildings and evil supervillains, but what they weren't okay with was psychological trauma and things that were real and things that were a lot closer to home. That scared a lot of people because, you know, they're for kids. <laughs> it's kind of annoying, but also you, you see a lot about society in these comic books, um, and especially from the art. I feel like the art in these books are like windows in time. I mean, not only like the fashion, uh, the fashion of the time, but also the the uh, the look and feel of the cities. I mean, an artist draws. I mean, look at, look at Tony Stark's choice of outfit here. Uh, very seventies, but like artists draw, you know, from experience. So you really get what you end up getting is like an artist, an artist's uh, introspective of of their time. Even though it is an Iron Man comic, you get what what they see, what they saw, which I just find like fascinating, really fascinating. And I love this book. Um, it's it's kind of kind of cheesy, like I say, just testing the waters. Like, oh, what can we get away with? What can we get away with? But anything that challenges, um, you know, the perception of of itself, really, anything that challenges that and and goes against the norm, I'm all for. Um, yeah. So Japanese. Japanese culture is kind of a weird one. Um, they don't really, back then definitely, now obviously not as much, but still they don't really talk about sex or violence or or anything like that, but instead they watch it in their films and they read it in their mangas. Um, and <laughs> Ota Kirihito, which is a book I read this week, is, is, uh, is truly shocking. I mean, Shocking, even today. I've made a list here of uh, of all its themes, and so it just—I mean, just so I didn't forget them. You know, it includes things like bestiality, medicine, platonic love, sexual frustration, rape, murder, conspiracy, and the question of humanity itself. I mean, it's but it is—it's profound and it's deeply thoughtful, and it's—it's it's also a little weird, but it's—it's it's fantastic and it's. It's groundbreaking, and again, it challenging, challenging its genre, saying no. Um, you know, he, he deals with some her, some 
issues that people don't even touch today. People are too scared to touch today. Tetsuka was doing it in 1970, and I... Love him for it. Yeah, love him for it. Um, what to do? Oh, I'm going to show you an example. I'm going to try and show you an example. Um, okay, another jump cut so I can find the example. Be right back. So a spider falls onto a man's head, and in literature this might have been described, but Tatsuka just suitably accentuates its features to have the desired effect. In the same way an author might exaggerate a scene, Tatsuka does the same with his art. When he looks up, there aren't just spiders on the ceiling, but they cover the ceiling, creating panic and then a scream of terror and then just silence. And he does all that without even using any words. Now reading graphic novels is not an inexpensive hobby. Both. Demon in a Bottle and Otakiri Hito cost the equivalent of um, $25 each, which is kind of £17.99 here. Um, but the way I look at it, you don't just... You're also paying for, like, a lot of... You're also paying for artwork. Like, Otakiri Hito has got 800 pages worth of beautiful artwork, which you can look at and stew over long after the story's finished. So that's kind of how I justify it to myself. Um, so, yeah, I... Yeah. I hope you enjoyed my little rant about comics. It's something I'm really passionate about, and I hope if you haven't checked out anything by Tetsuka, uh, then then you do so. I would recommend uh, Otsukiri Hito, and I would also recommend uh, M.W. Uh, this one, which is another one of my favourites, and it's kind of worth pointing out that if uh, if you're a little bit squeamish and you don't like some of that uh, really dark, disturbing stuff, then. Maybe it might not be for you, but I, I hope you give it a go. I hope you give it a go for the course of this project. In terms of what the Westerners have to offer, you can't go much wrong with uh, Alan Moore's Watchmen and Frank Miller's Sin City, which is gorgeous. He uses black and white just better than anyone, and they're just really gorgeous books. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, next week I'm reading the Graveyard book by Neil Gaiman. I think Sarah read this. Sarah read it. Uh, so I thought I'd pick it up. It's three for two in my bookstore, and I thought uh, I got a good review of one of my fellow book fighters, so I thought I'd check it out. Um, so I'll be talking about that next week, as well as a little bit about the Art of War next week, as well as a giant question palooza for all the questions I missed this week because this video was so damn long. Um, so yeah. That's my video for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I just I keep thinking all the plans I had for this video. Like, I was going to show you all different um, comic books from different ages and eras. And But never mind. Um, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. Don't forget to be awesome. And Laura and I will see you tomorrow.